Welcome back to MMA Al Dente. I am the guy who picked Chris Lieben to defeat Anderson Silva. And I'm here to preview UFC Fight Night 246, Moreno versus Albazi. Opening up the card, we have Jamie Lynn Horth versus Ivana Petrovich. My prediction for this fight is Jamie Lynn Horth wins by decision. I just have a little more faith in her. I think uh, I can say she belongs in the UFC. I'm not quite sure if I'd say that yet about Ivana Petrovich. So I'm leaning towards Jamie Lynn Horth here. Horth is one and one in the UFC. That's where she suffered her one loss to Veronica Hardy. Uh, but it was a really close loss, a split decision. And one where I thought she kind of came alive and was able to win the second half of the fight after catching up to Hardy. Or maybe just slowing Hardy down, really. But uh, that was a very close fight. And of course, the fight before that, she beat Haley Cowan in a back and forth fight. Really competitive one where she was, again, the better woman down the stretch in round three. And I thought that's what made her deserve the victory. And of course, before that, she's coming off of three consecutive loss, uh, wins, uh, three consecutive wins in round three, which I love. And that's what got her into the UFC. And they're all over good competition as well. She beat this girl, Myra Contueria and Corinne Lafouin-Bois by rear naked choke in round three. And the girl Corinne just lost on the contender series a week ago or a few weeks ago. So she's... Uh, Still knocking on the door of the UFC. And then she had knocked out this other girl, Jade Masson Wong, with a kick to the body in round three. So those are good fighters. Maybe not UFC level, but just a notch below. And she's been able to close the show down the stretch and in some competitive fights as well. She faced adversity. She was dropped against the girl Corinne. And she was able to uh, weather storms and get roughed up and finish those fights. And, of course, with what we've seen in the UFC, I trust her cardio, and I think she's UFC level. And I have to mention, she beat uh, Lupita Godinez twice by decision as an amateur. So, just know that happened. Ivana, Sirich, uh, Ivana Petrovich, who used to be known as Ivana Sirich, uh, she's 7-1. She suffered her one loss inside the UFC as well. That was in her debut. And it was to Luana Carolina. I thought the story of that loss was wrestling failure, uh, her losing wrestling scrambles and uh, getting wizard over and bowled over and just not the dominant wrestler that uh, she was on the regional scene, not uh, as dominant. And Luana was a little too much for her positionally, but she bounced back and got her first UFC win in her last fight against Na Young, where she got a third round finish with an arm triangle choke. Uh, so that was a great look, but Na Liang is one of the most uh, uh, reliable collapsers, if that's a word. Uh, one of the most reliable front runners who will fade down the stretch, and that's what happened there. She came out of the gate hot. She was bullying Ivana, landed some good punches and ripped her to the mat early, and then faded and got dominated and put away. But I have to say, this girl Ivana's also gotten her share of finishes down the stretch, round three, and even round four against this girl Uwalina, Uwalina Wozniak, uh, right before she got to the UFC, a round four rear naked choke, which was a great win. And she was dropped in that fight. Uh, so she's faced adversity as well. As well. But uh, again, I just don't have as much faith in her as I do Jamie Lynn Horth. I, J I think Jamie Lynn Horth is a little smaller. She's an inch shorter, but I think she's more physical. I think she's stronger and she would be the bully inside in tight. And that's going to make it tough for her to be bowled over because both girls, frankly, are good on the, on top They're That's where they get the majority of their finishes. You know, they've each got a ton of TKO finishes. And aside from that body shot, I think they're all on the ground. Even uh, Ivana's got what's listed as a knockout in a minute and a half against this girl, Eileen Torcado. That's on the ground. Uh, it wasn't on the feet. And it wasn't a knockout. It was a TKO. So I don't know what Sure Dog's doing there. But either way, uh, both girls want to be on top. And I do think Jamie Lynn Horth would win that battle and get on top where she'd be a big problem. And on the feet, I favor Jamie Lynn Horth. I think Ivana Petrovich can make shit happen, but it's a means to an end. Jamie Lynn 
is the girl that would win the kickboxing bout, in my opinion. I trust her more on the feet. I like the way she's looked in the UFC on her feet. And I think she would get the better of Ivana. Uh, so I'm picking Jamie Lynn Horth to win here. I've got her winning by decision. And I haven't bet on her yet. Uh, but I'll consider it. I just have to wait till everything's available. But I'm definitely leaning towards Jamie Lynn Horth. Uh, but again, these girls have gotten a lot of uh, last minute, late finishes deep into the fight. So uh, maybe if the odds are that long, it'd be worth playing a sprinkle. Uh, yeah, I think they're both dominant uh, on top, but Jamie Lynn's more likely to be there. So I've got Jamie Lynn. I'll take her by decision, and I'll wait to see if and how to bet on this. Next up, we have Cody Gibson versus Chad Ann Helger. My prediction for this fight, and I don't like saying this, is Cody Gibson wins by decision. I don't like saying it because I'm a big Chad and Helger fan. He's one of my favorite fighters, even though I've only been watching him fight for a few years now. Uh, but the guy is grit personified. He's a walking comeback. His whole career is a comeback. And every win he's had in the last few years is a comeback. And that includes his last one, even though it was by decision over Shara Lampos Gregorio. And I think uh, here... He's definitely in this matchup. You know, I'll, I'll be looking to sprinkle on his traits anyway in the round three and all the bullshit. But I think uh, he is in the realm of duplicating the success that Brad Katona had against Cody Gibson, even though that was a razor thin fight. Uh, but Chad Ann Helliger's got excellent hands. He does have the same exact stature as uh, Brad Katona, where he's given up a lot of height and reach to Cody Gibson. And uh, no matter what, those will cause problems early, like I thought they did for Brad. Uh, but Brad was able to slow him down, and I thought put up better numbers and better strikes and narrowly get the better of Cody Gibson down the stretch to win the ultimate fighter. Chad and Helger, he's not nearly as proven as Brad Katona, and I think he's a little bit lesser of an athlete and a physical problem. Uh, but he's... He's a round three fighter. He's fighting in Canada, by the way. He is a Canadian fighting in Canada. And I think, again, technically, he's in this matchup. He's got to keep this fight standing against Cody Gibson. And then it's still not like it's a lock for him. He's got a lot of problems on the feet. But I think it's a winnable fight for him if he's able to keep this standing and tire Cody Gibson out a little bit. Chad's boxing tends to come alive. But I am picking Cody because I do think Cody is, a, I know he's bigger, and I do think he can rack up control time. He's going to have to because, again, these are hometown judges or whatever, hometown fans uh, for Chad and Helger that will be swaying the judges. Uh, but Cody has a better grappling altogether than Chad and Helger, and I envision him not finishing Chad, even though that's what it would seem like when you plug in their records. But I envision him getting some control, snatching a body triangle with his longer legs and just uh, racking up enough control where if he does fade, he still wins on points. Uh, but that's no lock. And even though Chad and Helger has been finished in six of his seven losses, all of which are by submission, by the way, I still would be really surprised if Cody was able to submit Chad. And I know he looked uh, really good submitting uh, Brian Kelleher recently. And even his win before that was against Francisco Rivera. You know, his last professional win before that was against Francisco Rivera. And that was an arm triangle choke, same move, but in round three. And that was an excellent fight. He was almost knocked out in that fight in round two. Uh, but Cody Gibson was able to weather that storm and close the show in round three. He's never been knocked out, Cody. Uh, neither guy's ever been knocked out. Like I just mentioned, Cody was roughed up and nearly knocked out against Francisco Rivera. Uh, but he was able to survive. And Francisco is one of the more dangerous guys he's probably ever fought. That guy was a fucking killer. And if you don't know, he was in the UFC 10 years ago, whatever. Uh, but still, this is going to be a close fight, I think. I don't think Cody's going to run through Chad on the ground. Chad, despite having been finished six times, five of those come like over 10 years ago or whatever. 
He was two and five to begin his career. And then he turned a corner and just leveled up year after year and didn't lose again until he made it to the UFC. He lost by decision to Haile Alatang. And he lost by rear naked choke in the final seconds of the fight to Jose Johnson, which uh, I consider more of a testament to Jose Johnson's danger, but not any lack of grit or cardio for Chad and Helger. I still think he's the same problem in round three. And he showed so in his next fight against Charles Lampos Gregorio. But yeah, this one will be close. I do uh, think Cody Gibson does not have as good a cardio as uh, uh, Chad and Helger, but he's still shown to be a really tough guy to get out of there as of late. His last three losses are by decision. Even if I thought he slowed down and lost two in, rounds two and three against Ray Borg and Brad Katona, he still didn't allow himself to get finished. And Borg was all over him, trying to force an arm triangle choke and whatever uh, in the final minutes of that fight. And I have to mention he has been finished four times by submission, Cody Gibson. Uh, and three of those are by guillotine choke. And they're all down the stretch. One in his first UFC stint against Manny Gambirian in round two. But the other two were in round three. And Chad and Helger, he may not be the biggest submission threat. But for a guy who's only got three submissions, all three of them are guillotine. Again, not that I'm just plugging in records here, but I'm saying if uh, Cody Gibson's falling apart and Chad and Helger comes alive in round three, there might be something there. Uh, but I still would uh, think if Chad was to win, uh, it would be by decision, where it looks kind of like the Katona fight and he's able to win rounds two and three, keep this standing, and take away that 10 inches of reach by being, or whatever, it's not 10 inches, but substantial reach and height and getting in his face with his sharper boxing, kind of like Brad Katona did. Again, Chad and Brad have the same exact height and reach, I believe. So I'd love to see Chad, uh, Chad and Helger win, and I'll bet on everything, the round three finish, the comeback, the fucking inverted triangle choke, and all the rest of it. Uh, but if you put a gun to my, my head and you said, tell me who wins or you die, I'd say Cody Gibson by decision. And I'll look for that as well. I'll see what the props look like here. Uh, but yeah, for now, gun to my head, I'm going Cody Gibson. Next up, we have Serhi City versus Garrett Armfield. My prediction for this fight is Garrett Armfield wins by decision. I think he's got excellent hands, good fundamental striking, and I think he's going to be able to... Uh, get in the face of Serhi City, and land the better shots for a decision. Despite Serhi City being five inches taller, whatever he is, and having two inches of reach, and also being a solid, creative striker himself. But I think Garrett's a little more bread and butter. I think he's got more pop in his punches, and I think his hands uh, will win him this fight. Uh, of course, Garrett is a very dangerous guy, so if he's winning, there's a good chance it's by knockout. But I'm going with decision here because this guy, sir, he said he looks pretty tough, even though he was uh, roughed up in his last fight. Uh, but yeah, let me address the losses here. Sir, he said he's got two losses. They're both by decision. He lost his last one to Ramon Tavares in a rematch where he knocked the guy out in a minute on the Contender Series or a few minutes. And then they rematched uh, later on that year, or a few months later, whatever it was. And Serhi City, I thought, won that fight. But he was robbed. And on top of that, his opponent missed weight by a lot. So it was just a, a horrible night for Serhi City. Uh, but in that fight, he showed grit because he was roughed up early, uh, hurt at the end of round one and dropped in round two. But I still thought he battled back really hard, got in the face and made his pressure and his volume the story of the fight to the point where it was undeniable. I know I just talked about him getting dropped and roughed up and whatever, but in the end, I'd call that a robbery. I'd say that was a very bad decision against uh, Ramon Tavares. I, I guess I would say it's a very bad decision, but I wouldn't hold it against you if you use the word robbery. Either way, uh, that could easily be a victory. And his other loss is also by decision. And it's to Mateo Alejandro Vogel, 
one of the best fighters in Canada, and he's one of the few guys who have beaten Garrett Armfield, by the way, which I'll get to in a minute. Uh, but he's a dominant grappler, and he was all over Surrey City, uh, put him in a bunch of bad positions, dominant positions, and threatened him with subs, and Surrey City was able to survive that whole fight, was able to keep himself safe, and even find little moments to battle back even right up until the end of the fight. So overall, was a good look for him, just being a defiant, durable fighter. Uh, but still, that's the best example I have of a ground game for him. He also won one fight by submission with a triangle choke, but I still feel like not getting submitted and overwhelmed by the guy Vogel is the best case I can make for his ground game. But that's still not enough of a ground game in my opinion, for him to uh, plug himself into the record of Garrett Armfield and be his fourth submission loss. Because uh, that is the way Garrett Armfield has lost. He's got four losses, three of which are by submission. All of these fights, the three submissions and the one decision, are all these losses are to excellent UFC-level fighters. The guy Vogel that I mentioned, he could easily be in the UFC right now. He's beaten a good chunk of UFC fighters already. Uh, but he was able to strangle Garrett Armfield by forcing a takedown out of nowhere, really. Garrett was having his way with him, and uh, he just got, got caught slipping and uh, let the guy take his back standing and was uh, forced to tap. His other two submission losses come in the UFC in the last few years. He stepped up on short notice, I think very short notice, and moved up in weight where he lost to David Onama with an arm triangle in round two, which, by the way, that was a rematch because Onama beat him uh, by decision in an amateur fight. And then in his last fight, he was submitted by Brady Heastag, who I thought the fight could have been getting away from him, and he came alive in round three because he's a fucking round three grappling monster. So there's no shame in any of those losses, nor is there shame to his one decision loss, which comes way back to Ronnie Lawrence, who's uh, still in the UFC. So I have Brady Heastan. He doesn't have the pretty record, uh, but he's a guy who's been through a lot, and I think he's definitely a UFC-level fighter. He's 2-2, two and two, but his one win, especially over Brad Katona, means a lot. That was a surprising win to me, and that's my basis, really, for uh, picking him to win this fight. I do think... He's going to be keeping the standing, not that I expect uh, the most takedowns from uh, Surrey City. And on the feet, uh, even though Surrey City can do what he did in his last fight and overwhelm Garrett Armfield with volume and range, perhaps, I don't think that's going to be happening. I think Garrett Armfield's going to be the quicker guy. I think, again, his punch is going to have more pop on him, where if anybody's going to get a knockdown, I'd favor Garrett or a knockout, frankly. Because, again, Surrey City uh, was hurt in his last fight. And Garrett Armfield's got the majority of his wins being by knockout. Uh, but I think Surrey, I think uh, Garrett Armfield wins by decision anyway. And he does so by uh, getting the better of Surrey City and not falling apart. I don't think Surrey City's going to be able to turn the tie with a takedown. And I haven't seen Garrett collapse cardio-wise or any other way on the feet. And... I've got him uh, uh, pulling away with a victory here by decision. Uh, so that's the pick. I'm taking Garrett Armfield by decision. I'll wait for the props and see uh, what, what there is to bet on. Uh, but I like his money line right now. It's plus 135. And again, he is my pick. Next up we have Rodrigo Nascimento taking on Alexander Romanov. My prediction for this fight is Romanov wins by decision because I'm fucking stupid. It really doesn't make a lot of sense to pick Romanov via decision. And believe me, I have no faith, especially in the decision part. It's a little more faith with Romanov altogether. Uh, but even that is limited, the amount of faith, because he's had a pretty shaky UFC career. Let's face it. The basis for the prediction is, look, I don't think either guy can dominate the other one. And just pull him over and get him out of there quickly by being on top. That's how each guy would like to win. And I don't think that's a path to victory for either guy. Romanov just wants to Donkey Kong you, get you on the ground, and smash your face with hammer fists or shove his forearm in your throat and make you tap. 
And I guess there is a small chance that happens, but I don't think it's going to happen. Rodrigo Nascimento is a bigger guy. I think he's, I mean, I don't know. Uh, Romanov might come in very heavy or he might come in looking like a fucking middleweight. You never know with him. But I think he's going to be a gorilla that can physically match Rodrigo Nascimento in tight. And on the outside, not that he's Mr. Outside Striker, but I think Romanov is faster and more athletic. Where, at the very least, he'll make it difficult for Nascimento to corner him and try to uh, get him in tight. I'm favoring Romanov, but he is the guy that I don't, you know, between the two, I trust his cardio less Romanov. Of course, he collapsed against Marcin Tabora. That's one of his three losses. He came out of the gate hot, got himself half a 10-8 round, or one-third of a 10-8 round, really, and then uh, ran out of gas and lost 10-9 for the rest of the fight. So it ended up being a majority loss, a majority decision loss. Uh, against uh, Marcin Tibora. But his other losses, there was no cardio about it. They both ended within two and a half minutes. Uh, one was him being TKO'd by Alexander Volkov, who's six foot ten or whatever he is. He's got a whole different physicality and skill set compared to Rodrigo Nascimento. And I don't think uh, that's a path to victory for Rodrigo, even though uh, he technically put him away on the ground. And Jayota Almeida put him away on the ground with a rear naked choke in two and a half minutes in his last fight. nascimento has got good grappling skills, but Jailton Almeida has better grappling skills and he's got the athleticism of Yoel Romero to back him up. So I think that was just a very bad matchup for Romanov, despite Almeida being a light heavyweight not long ago. Uh, Nascimento, I may as well mention his two losses. They're both by knockout. He was steamrolled by Chris Dawkins back when Dawkins was the best heavyweight prospect. And Dawkins, say what you will about him, and I kind of did just shit on him, uh, but he had excellent hands, really fast, especially for a heavyweight, and that was the difference. And his last loss comes against Derek Lewis in his last fight earlier this year, whatever, and uh, Lewis was able to knock him out in round three. It was a competitive fight and a very grinding type of fight. Uh, but then in round three, Derek Lewis hit him with a big shot, a big one-two, and uh, put him on his ass and then pounced on him and put him away. Lewis, of course, is one of the heaviest hitters ever. So it's no shame with that guy going through your chin. But that's how he's lost now. It's two losses and his chin has failed him. I have to say I don't consider that a big path to victory for Romanov. He's not exactly the biggest force on the feet. I think he moves well and his striking is coming along, even though he's already got 20 fights. Uh, but he's definitely not in that realm of uh, Chris Dawkins and certainly not Derek Lewis. Uh, the majority of his wins, TKOs, come on the ground. There might be one or two standing, but uh, if, if you told me Romanov won by TKO... The fight I'm envisioning is him on top of somebody and doing Donkey Kong hammer fists. And yeah, I think uh, neither guy really plugs into the other guy's losses. And I envision this being a grinding decision fight. I think Romanov is faster on the outside and could maybe do more there. And I also think Romanov in round one could be the gorilla and just a uh, bully Nascimento. And then down the stretch... Look, I have doubt about the cardio of Romanov, uh, but it's not like it's a lock. I mean, his last time going past round one uh, was against uh, Bogoy Ivanov, and that was his first time after the collapse against Marcin Tabora, and he, he handled himself well and won a good decision with a lot of striking. And I'm just favoring Romanov here. I favor him to win because I think he's a little faster and a better athlete. And in tight, even though he's a little smaller and whatever, he's still a fucking gorilla. So I think he's able to take away the strengths of Nascimento and uh, outpoint them narrowly to win a decision. That's the prediction. There's not a lot of faith in it. Uh, you know, uh, especially the decision part, like I said. But yeah, slight lean towards Alexander Romanov. Next up, we have Jack Shore versus Yusuf Zalal. My prediction for this fight is Zalal wins by decision. Although a submission would not totally surprise me. 
but I'm picking Zalal because he's a well-rounded guy who's incredibly durable. And uh, despite a tough run in his first UFC stint where I thought he was underrated, uh, since then he's done nothing but finish guys. And he's looked good coming back to the UFC, getting two rear naked chokes, especially that win over Billy Quarantillo. And I think he's an above average featherweight inside the octagon. And that's the thing. He's a featherweight. And Jack Shore is a new featherweight. I still don't know exactly what to make of him. He suffered his first loss after going 16-0 and against uh, Ricky Simone two years ago. He lost by arm triangle choke in round two. And that was a pivotal loss for him because after that, he decided to move up to featherweight. And since moving up to featherweight, he's looked good, but he's one and one. His one win is over Maquan Amir Khani, where to beat Maquan, all you have to do is let him win round one. And that's what Jack Shore did. And then he strangled him with seconds left in round two. And against Joe Anderson Brito, he lost by Dr. Stoppage. And I... I'm not sure how the fight would have looked if it went the distance. I thought Joe Anderson was up one round. But Jack Shore was not out of that fight by any means. And he definitely wasn't finished, which is impressive going up against Joe Anderson Brito. Uh, I mean, it wasn't a legitimate finish, you know. Uh, But yeah, look, uh, that's how he looks at featherweight. At at bantamweight, I thought he looked phenomenal. Uh, you know, his last win was over Timur Valiev. That's a very valuable win. He was, whatever, 5-0 and in the UFC uh, before he lost to Simone. But, yeah, the loss to Simone, that, and plus, I'm sure, his body and the weight cuts and whatever he was feeling made him move up to featherweight. And, uh, and he was dropped by Ricky Simone as well. I don't know if that played a role in it. Uh, but either way, maybe he considers himself healthy at, healthier at featherweight and uh, here he is. But I think, uh, of course, on the flip side, uh, there's a physicality disadvantage when you move up 10 pounds. And I think that could be the difference. Uh, that could be the difference, certainly with Jack Shore not being able to take down Yusuf Zalal and uh, work his game on top. But also, Yusuf is a very dangerous submission artist himself. If he's able to win that battle and uh, get on top of Jack Shore, Jack could be in trouble. Yusuf's proven to be an excellent finisher. He's got 12 finishes in his 15 wins, eight of them by submission. And, uh, of course, I have to mention, yeah, he's on a nice uh, winning streak here in the UFC, two consecutive rear naked chokes. And that first one especially was very impressive because he beat Billy Quarantillo, who's a really tough guy and has excellent cardio. And Yusuf dominated him and got him out of there in round two on short notice. So I feel like uh, things are just trending Yusuf Zalal's way. He's 28 years old, probably not even in his prime yet, but he's got a lot of momentum. And I think uh, here, this should be a good matchup for him. I think uh, Jack Shore is not likely to take down Yusuf Zalal. Yusuf's been taken down and controlled. Uh, but again, these are bigger, stronger guys. You got uh, Sengwu Choi and fucking Ilya Taporia. And none of these guys could totally dominate him. Again, he was the last man standing against Ilya Taporia. I thought he had his best round in round three. So, yeah, it's definitely a uh, a good matchup between two guys that I still think are excellent fighters. And Jack Shore, I uh, I would love to be wrong about him here in a sense because I had really high a uh, really high opinion of him at bantamweight. Uh, But again, the 10 pounds, it's going to cost you in some fights. And I'm picking it to happen here. Yusuf Zalal may not have the athleticism and physicality of a Joe Anderson Brito, uh, but he's a slick, well-rounded guy. And he's uh, really tough to put away and tough to dominate. And I think uh, with his cardio and a little bit of a size advantage, he's going to be able to rack up the better points and get the better positions and win this fight. I've got it happening by decision, but of course, Jack Shore has been legitimately beaten once, and it was by arm triangle choke in round two. So there's that. I'll wait for the prop, see if anything jumps out. I haven't bet on Zalal as of yet. Next up we have, who do we have? 
Charles Jourdain versus Victor Henry. My prediction for this fight is Victor Henry wins by decision. I think this is a fight between two really tough guys. I'd be surprised if either guy got finished, even though Charles Jourdain was knocked out for the first time this year against Gian Silva. Uh, but unless his chin has suffered tremendously from that loss, I think he'll be able to stand up to the danger of Henry. And I feel very confident in saying Henry would stand up to the danger of Charles. And in a point fight, I favor the guy that I expect to bring more activity, and that's Victor Henry. I think his volume will win him this fight. I don't think this will be, I think this will be contested on the feet. I don't envision a lot of grappling at all. Maybe Charles will try to mix some things in, and he's been pulling off some nice guillotines in the last few years. Uh, but I don't think it would work against Henry, and I don't think he's going to be able to impose too much of a grappling fight on Henry here. Henry's going to keep this standing. And it still won't be a decisive victory, I think, but I think Victor will pull it off. He's a solid grinder, uh, excellent work rate, and uh, I think uh, he wins this one again with some volume on his side. Victor Henry's never been finished. He's suffered six losses, all six are by decision. We've seen a few of them in the UFC. Charles Jourdain, he's only been finished twice, once by submission, uh, that third round darts to Julian Arosa. No shame there. And once by knockout to John Silva. John Silva. No shame there. That guy looks like a fucking monster. So he's shown, a, I mean, a little more fragility as of late. But again, I don't think that's going to be the story of the fight against Victor Henry. Henry's put away enough guys in his career to respect him. But at the UFC level, he's definitely more of a grinder. Although he's coming off a nice finish over uh, Hani Yaya or Ronnie Yaya. But Ronnie Yaya, uh, despite all of his experience and all the durability and whatever else he's shown in his career, he's been a limited guy. And the guy that lost to Victor Henry or was finished by him was a limited guy in his 40s. Uh, but speaking of which, look, Victor Henry is 37 and a half years old. So that durability I was just praising of his. That could come crashing down any second now. Uh, but I'm not picking it to. I still think he's looked sharp inside the octagon. Uh, and I think he's looked incredibly durable. That eye poke to Javid Basharat notwithstanding. Uh, so, yeah, I think this will be a really close fight. I don't think uh, anybody's going to be able to uh, change gears here. I think this is a stand-up fight. And I've got Victor Henry increasing the volume, pouring it on Charles Jourdain. And narrowly winning by points. That is the prediction. Next up we have Ariane Lipsky versus Jasmine Jazdavicius. My prediction for this fight is Jazdavicius wins by decision. And of course when I envision a decision victory, I'm envisioning a lot of top control from Jazdavicius. And speaking of which, Lipsky has been finished twice inside the octagon from girls with top control. So, again, even though I'm picking a decision, if Jasmine is able to get on top of her and dominate her and smother her for a good bit, I think finishing opportunities could open up down the stretch. Who knows? Jasmine, of course, only has one finish inside the octagon. It is a third round, like last minute finish over uh, Priscilla Cachoeira, who, by the way, knocked out. Ariane Lipsky a year or two ago inside the octagon, a standing knockout. Not that that's relevant because I don't think Jasmine is going to knock her out. I think Jasmine, if she wins this fight, whether it's by finish or decision, it's with wrestling. She is a wrestler first and foremost, and I think that's going to present a lot of trouble for Ariane Lipsky. Lipsky's able to thwart a lot of girls wrestling with her physicality. She's a bigger girl for a flyweight. Uh, she comes close to matching the size of Jasmine. Uh, they're, they're, and uh, she's strong. But uh, I think that works well with lesser athletes, with uh, lesser wrestling. But Jasmine Jazdavicius has superior wrestling, and I think it's going to prove to be a tough matchup for Lipsky. And I don't think Lipsky's going to be able to move around and uh, find a submission with uh, Jasmine all over her. Uh, Lipsky, she did lose those two TKO losses to Antonina Shevchenko and uh, Montana De La Rosa. 
who's a better grappler than Antonina Shevchenko. Uh, but both girls were able to beat her by TKO on the ground in round two. It was three or four years ago, so I'm sure she's improved. But I think with the wrestling of Jasmine, uh, she's very much in danger here in this matchup, uh, even in danger of getting finished. But look, Ariane Lipsky has looked really good as of late since her loss to Priscilla Cachoeira two years ago. She's 3-1. and one. All three wins were solid. A split decision over Melissa Gatto, who is an excellent fighter still. And then a unanimous decision, lopsided over J.J. Aldrich. And an armbar over Casey O'Neill, in which she looked phenomenal. But then after that, she lost to Karine Silva, who still has an incredibly high ceiling. One of the best prospects in the UFC, if you could even call her that. Uh, but Karine, who was a killer, an absolute killer in every one of her victories, wasn't able to finish Ariane Lipsky. And Lipsky, I thought, outlasted her and took the third round. So she's, in general, looked very good lately. Uh, but again, I think this is just going to be a bad matchup for her. A girl's had problems on her back fighting a girl who's going to put her on her back. And it's not like there's some easy path to victory over Jasmine. Jasmine's lost three times, and they're all to UFC-level fighters. Elise Reed outside the octagon, where she had a lot of success mounting Elise Reed and taking her down, but Elise Reed would escape from that and had the better hands. And then her two losses inside the octagon are to uh, Tracy Cortez and Natalia Silva. Each girl could be challenging for a title in their future. Uh, both girls are incredible fighters, especially Natalia. And even though Ariane Lipsky has an advantage on the feet for sure in this fight, uh, she doesn't have quite that advantage like Natalia Silva did. So... I think uh, Jasmine Jastavicius has no real gaping hole in her game, and she's got no durability issues of any sort, which is good because Ariane Lipsky is dangerous and versatile. And I think uh, the wrestling will be the story of this fight. Lipsky will be put on her ass, and I've got Jasmine winning. I'll take her winning by decision, but I might go reaching for some props because I'm a degenerate. Next up, we have Eamon Zahabi taking on Pedro Munoz. My prediction for this fight is Pedro Munoz wins by decision. The basis for the prediction is that he's incredibly tough. He might be the toughest guy in the sport, Pedro Munoz. He's definitely in that class with Dan Ige of these guys who have fought everybody in their weight class and never submitted or knocked out. Pedro Munoz, just like Dan Ige. And I think despite him being 37 or whatever he's at now, 38 years old, I still trust his durability, not only to not get knocked out, but to not get knocked down or rocked or knocked silly and give Eamon Zahabi any big moments with his strikes. And from there, I take Pedro to win because I think he puts up better numbers. I think he'll be in Eamon Zahabi's face, throwing more, bringing more pressure. I think his leg kicks are really effective. And even though I give Eamon Zahabi a power advantage, I think Pedro Munoz has deceptive power. He really does. Some tricky power there. And again, Eamon Zahabi is the one guy who has been knocked out, even if it was to a spinning back elbow from Ricardo Hamos with his signature move. Uh, but yeah, at this point, that was fucking seven years ago. So it's not like it's a major factor for Eamon Zahabi. But you know what? Just like Pedro Munoz, Eamon is no spring chicken himself. Because since that fight, whatever it was seven years ago, I bet he hasn't had seven fights since then. He's just been a rel relatively inactive guy. Uh, here he's fighting, I think, for the second time this year after that win over Javed Basharat. Uh, but still, he's just not active enough for a guy who's been in the UFC for however many years he's been here now. Uh, but yeah, I think Eamon Zahabi is definitely in the realm of winning this fight. Uh, he looked great against Javed Basharat. That was a really difficult matchup, and Eamon was able to figure him out and very patiently outstruck him. 
Maybe he didn't outstrike him with the better numbers, but he landed the better shots, poured it on when he needed to. And I thought that was an excellent performance, the best of his UFC career. And he walked away with a great decision victory over a guy who had never been beaten. But here against Pedro Munoz, Pedro, he's, I'm counting on him not to get hurt. I, I think he's uh, Pedro is an incredible submission artist as well. He's got that guillotine, which is an incredible weapon. And uh, the volume, I think, should really be the difference for Pedro Munoz. I think he can get in Eamon Zahabi's face, bring that pressure, and touch him up. And if, even if he doesn't have any big moments, he should win on the small moments. So I'm going with Pedro Munoz. I've got him winning by decision. And I'll wait to see the props like I do with every other fight before I commit to a losing fucking bet. Next up, we have Mike Malott versus Trevin Giles. My prediction for this one is Mike Malott wins by round one submission. I think he's an incredibly dangerous guy. And this is a good fight for him to get back on track. Because even though Trevin Giles is a game fighter who can give you hell, he's still a vulnerable guy. He's been finished in all six of his losses, three by knockout and three by submission. And Mike Malad, who's finished all 10 of his wins, four by knockout, six by submission. I think he's too dangerous for Giles, and he's going to be able to close the show. Malad's been finished in both of his losses as well. He's got a 10-2 and two record. I may as well mention he's been finished in both of those. He lost to Hakeem Dawadu back at 145 over 10 years ago in the PFL, or the World Series of Fighting. And since then, I think he decided to move up in weight. He actually had a really rough fight at lightweight in Bellator, which ended up being a draw and a great example of a cardio failure for Mike Malad. And then his last loss comes in his last fight in 2024, where he was TKO'd by Neil Magny and the second great example of a cardio failure for Mike Malad. He was dominating Neil for 90% of that fight. And then in the final 10%, Neil didn't even hit him or, you know, uh, knock him down or anything. He just took him down, advanced on him, and Malad had nothing left couldn't escape, and Neil was able to force a comeback victory and an incredible one at that in round three. So yeah, Mike Malat moving forward, the biggest issue of his has to be cardio, and no doubt I'll be sprinkling against him in round three, regardless of who the opponent is, certainly here against Trevin Giles, but really the prediction is Mike Malat. Sprinkles might be going the other way, but the primary bet will be on Malat. I like his money line right now, but I have to wait for everything because I do think if he puts Giles, if he beats Giles, he's putting him away. And I would favor submission, but Malat's got dangerous hands as well. And uh, again, Giles can get clipped. He was knocked unconscious in his last one, even though that was the Carlos Prates. But I'd love to see Giles get past round one, get past the danger of Mike Malat and drag him into a war because Giles has been in those tooth and nail battles fighting on empty against uh, Roman Dalidze. And I think, it, you know, he could suffocate Mike Malat in that type of fight. I think most fighters could in that type of fight. But again, I'm sure Mike Malat has been doing everything to work and patch up that cardio because he's got to know it's his biggest liability moving forward. And it's one of the only liabilities because uh, this guy, it's mostly upside with him. He's still 10-2, 32 years old. And again, he's fucking killed everybody he's beat. Uh, so yeah, this one, I'd love to see it get interesting. Of course, if it gets past round one, even if it's a 10-7 round for Mike Malat, it'd probably be worth a betting on Trevin Giles. But I'm still picking Malat to win. I like him to win. I like him to win early. I think even if he does clip Trevin Giles and, you know, hurts him badly, I'd still favor submission over knockout. Uh, but either way, Malat, I've got him getting it done via finish. Next up, we have Dustin Stolzfus versus Mark andre Barrio. My prediction for this fight is Stolzfus wins via decision. I think he's been a little overlooked as a UFC fighter. 
I think his grappling has been overlooked because he's had some tough matchups in the UFC. Uh, but I think he's definitely the better grappler here. And if he can take this fight to the ground, and I think he can, I think he, at the very least, he can rack up enough points to win. He's definitely the better submission artist, but Mark andre Barrio has only been submitted once, and it was in round three against Fluffy Hernandez, and he didn't even tap. So at the very least, he's going to make it difficult for Stolzfus to tap him. But control is control, and that's the fight I envision, him winning on the ground. On the flip side, he's at a disadvantage, Dustin, on the feet. Because uh, Marc-Andre Barrio, he's got much better striking, and he's the more reliable finisher, for sure. I bring that up because each guy has been knocked out twice. Uh, just twice for each guy, really. But all four losses take place in the last two years. So each guy could have a compromised chin. And if that's the case, let's say both guys do, Marc-Andre Barrio is the much more likely candidate to cash in on a compromised chin. Stolzfus does have one legitimate knockout five years ago, uh, but not over anybody too great. And his only other one since then is an injury stoppage over Joe Piper, which is still a great fucking win, even if it's by bullshit. Uh, but, yeah, not likely to cash in on any weak chin, even though his striking has looked formidable in the UFC. But Mark andre Barrio definitely has the advantage there. And Dustin Stolzfus was uh, steamrolled by Abus Magomedov with a front kick and spinning back elbows from Bruno Fajeda. Both those guys got him out of there in round one. So he might have a chin issue, and Barrio could potentially go through that chin but Mark andre Barrio is in Mr. Round 1 finish. Not in the UFC, anyway. In fact, his only Round 1 finish in the UFC is his only submission victory altogether with a guillotine choke over Jordan Wright. One of the greatest glass cannons in MMA history. Uh, but, yeah, Barrio, when he wins, typically, with a knockout, it's down the stretch. And he's fatiguing you, sucking the life out of you, turning up the speed, turning up the gas and forcing a stoppage. And look, Stolzfus has been submitted twice in round three, so I suppose that's possible. Maybe there's something there, and Barrio's able to, over, able to overwhelm him. But uh, those submission losses are to Gerald Mearshart, the round three king, and Hadolfo Vieta, the jiu-jitsu king. So different styles altogether, different type of energy exertion and blah, blah, blah. I don't think Barrio can just plug himself into those losses there. So yeah, this is a, uh, an interesting fight. It would be really interesting to see these guys in a competitive fight that goes, uh, goes long, uh, down the stretch. I do think Mark andre Barrio is a generally in better shape here and he would pull away with a competitive fight, but I think Dustin Stolzfus is better on the ground and he can slow this fight down to the point where it's not so competitive by getting on top of Marc-Andre Barrio. And then should he do that, again, I don't predict he gets a submission. He's got to hang on down the stretch with Marc-Andre Barrio who will not be getting tired. So yeah, I'm going with Dustin Stolzfus. I got him winning by decision. It's not my most confident prediction, but I think there's something there. I think he's a little underrated, and I think Mark andre Barrio, despite having an advantage, he's not likely to go through a ch the chin of Dustin Stolzfus. Not like uh, Bruno Fajeda, who's incredibly dangerous, let alone his spinning back elbows. Uh, so yeah, could be a dicey fight. Really wouldn't be surprised to see any outcome, but I'm going with Dustin winning by decision. Next up, we have Kyle Machado taking on Brennison Hibiero. My prediction for this fight is Kyle Machado wins. And I'll go with him winning by a late round one knockout. And that sounds like a very confident prediction, but it's not. And it's mostly based on the durability issues of Brennison Hibiero. He's a guy who had a chin that I doubted before he got into the UFC. And then once he made it to the UFC, he was knocked out in a minute and a half against a Ming Yang Zhang. But uh, here, look, I don't have too much faith in the knockout prowess of Kyle Machado. So it's not like uh, 
this is a lock by any means. Kyle Machado is not Mr. Knockout, uh, but I think he's a good striker. I think he handled himself well in his two fights at heavyweight, which, by the way, this fight is at light heavyweight. Machado is cutting down to 205 here, which does bring some questions. That uh, could affect his chin, his cardio, I don't know. Uh, but I still think he's going to have a speed advantage over some light heavyweights, and this might be one of them. I don't know. Kyle Machado is pretty light on his feet. Of course, that's how he looked against Dante Mays. So maybe it's just a perception thing. Uh, but Machado's never been finished. Those are his two losses, Mick Parkin and Dante Mays. And I definitely think he won that Mick Parkin fight. And every time I revisited it, I felt the same way. And uh, he's got this nice win over Kevin Zaflarski on the Contender Series. But that's really his signature win. He doesn't have too many other great wins throughout his short career. Uh, but with what he's shown in the UFC, durability at the very least, I think that helps him in this matchup against Brennison Hibiero. Because Brennison Hibiero is a glass cannon. He's got 15 victories with 15 finishes. Never won a decision. And the glass part of it comes when you address his losses. He's got seven losses, and he's been finished in most of those as well. Submitted a few times, but knocked out a few times as well. Knocked out for the third time in his UFC debut. I don't know how the skills would match up with these two, to be honest. I think there's a chance Brennison Hibiero is the more skilled fighter overall when you take away uh, durability and whatever. Uh, but it is a fight. Durability is a thing. And I just don't have faith in Brennison Hibiero to even lean towards him in a fight. I'm just going to be picking against them and probably picking them to lose by knockout in every fight here. You plug in their records and it doesn't make that much sense on paper. I mean, Kyle Machado's got some TKO finishes, but again, he's not Mr. Knockout. Uh, but still, I just think Brennison Hibiero is that vulnerable. And here I don't envision it being a grappling fight. I don't envision it being a sloppy majority decision fight like his last one. And I think on the feet, uh, Brennison Abiero's got power and danger and the rest of it on his side. But Kyle Machado's light on his feet. He's not a bad striker. And the chin of Brennison Abiero is what I picked to be the story of this fight and his loss. So I'm going with Kyle Machado. I've got him winning by knockout. Of course, if that doesn't happen, you told me this one went the distance, I'd still probably favor Machado. I think uh, I have to see what he looks like at 205. But at heavyweight, I didn't think he looked bad. You know, he looked tough and uh, in good shape and the rest of it. And I'd pick him to outpoint uh, Brenson, Brenison Hibiero. But I'm going with a knockout. Next up, we have Janata Denise versus Derek Lewis. My prediction for this fight, and it pains me to say it, is Janata Denise wins by knockout. And I'll go with round two. I'm a gigantic Derek Lewis fan. He's my favorite heavyweight fighter. And I know he's in the realm of winning this fight. And I don't just mean on the feet with his gigantic power. But I really think if Derek Lewis is able to get on top of Janata Denise, he can put him away. Lewis has always been underrated on the ground. And I don't mean he's a fucking BJJ black belt or whatever, but he's always been underrated. And yeah, size and strength might be half of that, half of his skill set, but there's been something there. He's been able to advance to the full mount and knock many fighters unconscious from there. And even doing so deep into the fight in round four against Shamil Abdurakhimov. Although I don't think he went unconscious. Uh, but Derek... He's got a lot of things about him that are deceptive. The ground game's one of them. Cardio's another. And it might just be because he's got such a strong will. But uh, he's definitely, there's more than meets the eye with Derek Lewis. Here, though, there's got to be more than meets the eye. Because I think if he's coming at Janata Denise looking to stand and bang and throw them fangs, he's going to get the worst of it. I mean, he could definitely knock anybody out, including Denise. But then he seems like a pretty tough guy. And kickboxing-wise, I think he's going to be Derek Lewis's superior. And Lewis can take it, but he's been knocked out a bunch. And, of course, he's only getting older. And Janata Denise is a good kickboxer. 
you'll find the legs and the body and the chin. And I just think if these guys are kickboxing, Janata Denise is outpointing Derek Lewis uh, until he knocks him out. And I do think I would favor a knockout over a decision or anything else. Again, Lewis can knock out anybody standing. If he gets close enough, he's definitely the more powerful guy in this matchup. But uh, I think his best chance for a victory lies on the ground. And on Derek Lewis isn't Mr. Takedown, but if he's able to make it happen, he gets on top. That's a big body that you can't just move. I think Lewis can really do wonders on the ground. The Janata Denise, he had oh, he was taken down by Austin Lane, and he was taken down by uh Carl Williams in the last round of their fight. He looked really good in that fight, but I think Carl Williams had an easier time taking him down than even he expected, and it could have been a different fight with some different tactics. Lewis doesn't have nearly the wrestling of Carl Williams. It's not even fucking close. But he knows how to take you down, and he's a big, strong, 280-pound guy. So uh, I'd love to see Derek Lewis gear gear himself towards takedowns with everything he has, striking his way into range, getting in on the leg or whatever his best attack is, and finding a way to plant shit out the knees on his ass. Because I can tell you when he does lose, it's going to look like that in one way or another. And Derek Lewis, he's definitely not going to get anybody's respect as a Mr. Grappler or whatever, but he's been fighting at a very high level for a long time. He's shown underrated grappling throughout his career, and here would be the time to uh, come out of the gate like a fucking wrestler. You can tell I'd love to see it more than anything. But again, the prediction is Jonathan Denise wins. I think he will be too much for Lewis on the feet. Even though Lewis has only been beaten by excellent fighters, he's still been knocked out a bunch. Uh, You know, even he himself was very vulnerable on the ground and whatever. Not too many guys are able to finish him there. Certainly not Jailton Almeida. Uh, But yeah, I'm going with Denise. Round two knockout is the pick. And uh, I bet on his money line. I don't think you're going to get too much of a better line with the uh, props. But I will wait for the props. Next up, we have Aaron Blanchfield versus Rose Namajunez. My prediction for this fight is Rose Namajunez wins by decision. And I'm not too confident in the prediction. I think this is going to be a really close fight, and I think it's going the distance, regardless of who wins. But I favor Rose because I think she's the more agile, athletic fighter, and she can duplicate some of the success of Manon Fior. But she doesn't quite have the power, the stopping power uh, of Manon Fior to keep Erin totally off of her. And I think Erin is going to be pressuring her throughout this fight and trying to strike her way into takedowns. Speaking of which, takedowns could easily win this fight. It's just a 15-minute fight, and takedowns, top control, is often the difference maker. And even though Erin's the more likely wrestler on paper, or whatever, theoretically, Rose Namajunez has excellent takedowns. She's got some good takedowns, and she's been able to score points against wrestlers who have beaten Aaron Blanchfield, like Tracy Cortez. Not throughout the whole fight, but early on. And I think Rose has that option here against Aaron. Uh, I don't know if she'd win a straight-up wrestling match, but I know she's got excellent takedowns that can catch wrestlers off guard. So it's really going to be a tough fight. I think uh, even if Rose is scoring those takedowns, or if it's Aaron, they're both going to be... Uh, very competitive in a grappling match. No girl's going to get submitted here. And on the feet, it's going to be very competitive as well. Aaron doing more stalking and Rose Namajunas uh, on the back foot doing a little more dancing. But I've got Rose putting up better strikes and narrowly outpointing Aaron Blanchfield. No real faith in this. I mean, I bet on Rose because she's an underdog, but it wasn't a big bet and I still regret it. Uh, but I I think this will be tight no matter what happens. This will be one where I'll be looking to play uh, probably Rose by plus points because I think uh, the loser of this fight, regardless of who it is, is going to win a round. And again, nobody is getting finished. 
So I'm going with Rose Nama Yunez. I've got a winning by tight decision. There's no faith in it at all. And even though I bet on it, I haven't really bet on it. And I'm going to be waiting for the plus three and a half points, maybe plus five and a half, if the line isn't too much different. And in the main event of the evening, we have Amir Albazi returning to take on Brandon Moreno. My prediction for this fight is Moreno wins by decision. I still think Brandon Moreno is one of the toughest guys in the UFC. He's never been finished as a pro. And the one guy to finish him in an exhibition fight was Alessandre Pantoja, the world fucking champion who got him out of there with a rear naked choke in round two. And then beat him twice in the UFC by decision. Uh, but yeah, Moreno, I don't think he, I think he's still as durable as ever. So Amir Albazi with all of his danger, which he's got danger everywhere. I think Moreno will be able, will be able to stand up to that danger. And from there, I envision Brandon Moreno outpointing Amir Albazi. I think he's got the striking to duplicate the success of Kai Kara France and outpoint Albazi, even though Kai Kara France lost that fight on points. Uh, but he should have won that fight, and Brandon Moreno beat Kai Kara France by putting up better numbers and outlanding him, and then he knocked him out in the rematch with a body shot. Uh, but the point is, I still think Brandon Moreno is in his prime and he's going to give Amir Albazi a very difficult fight. If Albazi is able to take him down, I doubt he's going to be able to finish him and submit him or advance on him too well. Brandon Moreno is a really tough guy to control in the first place, unless you're Pantoja. And uh, on the feet, yeah, uh, Moreno is tough as all fuck. Albazi shown good pop in his punches. Got that beautiful finish in round three over Alessandro Costa right before he fought Kai Kara France. And even though Costa, I think, took that fight on short notice or whatever, to get that kind of knockout in round three with that big uppercut, it's uh, it shows power. And he keeps that power late in the fight. Just like Ilya Taporia, who broke my fucking heart. Uh, but... Yeah, he's a dangerous guy, Albazi, and he's tough as all fuck. His, you know, I can't say he's as tough as Moreno, but he's only lost once, and it was a decision to Jose Shorty Torres, who was in the UFC not long ago. That was a fight in which his wrestling was neutralized largely. I mean, it was there for him for one round, round two. Uh, but other than that, he was being outstruck and at times looked a little desperate. He was dropped but never hurt too badly and just lost a clear decision. Kind of like he did against Kai Kara France. Again, that was a bad decision, but still, uh, Albazi uh, fought his heart out and gave himself a shot at winning a bad decision there. And I suppose that could happen here, but I think Moreno uh, will be able to make this a little more decisive if he's... Uh, uh, winning a decision here. I envision him putting up better points. And I think uh, he hits a little harder than Kai. Or maybe he can make a difference. You know, if he's got the numbers on his side, I think they'll mean a little more. And I think Moreno uh, can really frustrate Amir Albazi in a five-round fight. Albazi, I haven't seen him since that fight. Uh, and he's still a young guy. So there's a chance he's leveled up. And leveled everything up, including his cardio and the rest of it, where he's just going to be a monster here and too much for Moreno. Uh, but I'm um, going with Moreno here. I think Moreno hasn't been gone too long. His losses as of late, you can give a lot of context to those by saying they're to the best two fighters in the world. And uh, here he's fighting a guy who's knocking on the door of the top five and he could be the best and we might all consider him the best in a year. But right now, he's a guy coming off a controversial decision to a guy that Moreno has decisively beaten twice. So I've got Brandon Moreno winning here. He's the more reliable five-round fighter. And even though there's no real questions about Amir Albazi or any major doubts with him, Moreno is such a well-rounded, durable guy with a great gas tank that I've got to favor him to win. So I'm going with the former champ. I've got him winning by decision. and. Uh, I will wait for the props because I'm pretty sure this does go the, uh, the distance. However, I'll say the one trait I'm sure of is Moreno's durability. 
So Albazi winning by decision, I consider his only path to victory. It's a five-round fight, so that may seem a little crazy, but I really trust the durability of Brandon Moreno. So if you're going to isolate Albazi's path to victory to one thing and trim your bet down, or beef it up, I should say, that might be the way to go. But yeah, I'm going Brandon Moreno. I hope he returns here and gets a, a good victory over a guy that will still probably be a contender in the future. Like, share, subscribe, all that horse shit, and check out my other videos. And by the way, I forgot to mention it before, but I know Mike Malott beat Trevin Giles in grappling. I've seen it. I just wish I mentioned it before. I'm a jerk off.